industries have always been said to be the backbone of any country's economy when we talk about giving a boost to any of the sectors industries are always on the forefront hello and welcome back to the amazing platform of pw and this is me your mentor your friend your guide in this journey of manufacturing industries so basically i was talking about a very simple term but that has a great meaning in fact when we talk about the economy of a country and that can be any nation let's let's take any nation for instance whenever we talk about the economy of a country the economy of a nation industries have always been the backbone of that right so whenever we talk about getting the much needed foreign exchanges when we talk about generating employment when we talk about reducing the burden on the primary sector that is the agricultural sector we always look forward towards the industries just imagine had there been no industries and the entire load would be on agriculture how poor would be the economy and how over stressed would be the economy so definitely here the industrial sector comes as a savior comes in the form of a savior to save this extra load that can always be present on the primary units or the primary sectors so we are going to study lots and lots of topic for the like in this entire chapter that is manufacturing industries so let me get my weapon and my weapon is very simple that's a simple pen okay so when we talk about the word manufacture if we break down this word in very very simple terms we are talking about something that we produce right so basically in this entire topic in this entire video we are going to talk about what what do you mean by manufacturing what is the importance of this manufacturing or industrial sectors how do we classify the different types of industries and apart from that we'll go into the intricate details of different types of industries and towards the end we'll also see that how these industries have also contributed to the negative causes like pollutions and and we are like pollution and environmental degradation and also we we'll like uh, take the example of ntpc how ntpc has set a uh, wonderful example by combating uh, this entire negative effects and as well as managing it in a more sustainable manner and also we'll come across some steps to combat with the increasing problems that the industries have produced right so be with me uh, you can get your refreshments you can get your energy drink anything that keeps you fueled anything that keeps you boosted up anything you can get for yourself right so let's get started so when you talk about manufacturing right so manufacturing in very simple terms means whenever we are converting a raw material into a processed product or a finished product that can be used by a consumer so this entire process of this conversion from raw material to a finished product is called as the manufacturing product right so when we talk about production of goods in large quantities after processing from the raw materials to more valuable products that is called as manufacturing so we have a raw material now this raw mate material is processed okay it is converted some value is added to it okay and it gets converted into intermediate form intermediate form and then finally this gets converted into a finished goods or a finished product form now this entire process of producing something is basically defined as your manufacturing now when we talk about the importance of manufacturing that why is manufacturing such an important uh, why, why what importance it holds right with respect to the economy so we'll come across different different things or different contributions that manufacturing sector manufacturing industries have always made number 1 to begin with manufacturing industries have not only helped in modernizing agriculture which forms the backbone of our economy remember that india has always been known to be a agrarian economy agrarian means in which one kind of sector is dominating in many terms like for example if we talk about in india agriculture dominates in the term of employment right it is a maximum employment generating sector however the numbers at times are fudged because of the data that's not that accurate available but still if we see the numbers so definitely we are going to find the highest ones in the agricultural sector itself and this agriculture sector has been modernized in the last few years and we can say that our agriculture has come a lot far from where it started right so at the eve of independence indian agriculture was in ruins but if you talk about the current scenario and the current state of indian agriculture it's far better than than what it was at the time of independence and thanks to the industrial developments that have made this possible so industrial developments or the industry or the manufacturing sectors it not only modernizes agriculture but also reduce the heavy dependence of people on agricultural income 
so apart from modernizing the agriculture apart from building up advanced equipments for the agricultural sector manufacturing sector has also been a great generator of employment opportunities for the people right otherwise extra dependence upon the agriculture would have put further pressure on the economy leading to more number of uncertainties and more employment rates right so that has been brought down with the help of your manufacturing sector now let's talk about this industrial development is a precondition for eradication of unemployment and poverty from our country now what do you mean by this statement let's try to get into the details of it it's very simple to understand when you talk about development of industries right more industries will definitely be needing more amount of labor in, in let's understand in a very layman language right suppose in a particular area there were five industries employing say 500 people now there are 10 more industries that have been recently opened up definitely those industries are going to bring some great employment opportunities and when people are employed when they have money to sustain definitely the conditions of poverty are going to become better so this is one of the positive outcomes we can talk about of the industrial development that it's a very important or a prerequisite for eradication of poverty from any kind of country or any kind of economy now moving on further that's the main philosophy behind the public sector industries and the joint sector ventures in india it is also aimed at bringing down the regional disparities by establishing industries in the tribal and the backward areas now what do we know here so very simple if you talk if you take a moment to ponder upon what this entire point is saying so we'll come to realize we'll come to realize ponder here means to think upon that okay so for all my lovely students who uh, are getting stuck at this word so this simplification is all for you okay so when we talk about thinking over something we can use the word ponder for it you can use a new word here okay so if you have learned we you know we all learn some things every day so the point here is when we're talking about the different kind of industries the different public sector ventures whenever we use the word public here we are referring to the government owned industries and whenever you're taking the word joint ventures joint ventures means it is working with the help of collaborative effort of public and private sector so these industries have come into play and they definitely bring uh, they have definitely aimed at bringing down the regional disparities regional disparities here means for example one section of the country is having huge number of industries people are enjoying good incomes good amount of employment opportunities on the contrary there is one more region which is not having all these acts accessibilities or facilities so basically there are many companies the government has also reached out in several areas several outskirts areas where earlier the development process was not there or it was not initiated now with the help of this industrial development those areas are also getting urbanized and getting much better facilities right now moving on further if you talk about the export of manufactured goods it expands the trade and commerce and brings in the much needed foreign exchange now if you talk about Indian industries, there are multiple products we export to the nearby neighboring countries. And when we are exporting it to the other countries, to the foreign countries, we are definitely bringing in the much needed foreign income, the foreign exchanges. So we can say that this plays a greater role in bringing about the much needed foreign income in the country. Now countries that transform their raw materials into wide variety of furnished goods or we can call this as finished goods as well. Right, finished means the final product that can be used for consumption okay so they are very much prosperous take the example of japan japan may be devoid of the natural resources but japan has worked a lot on its uh, human resources it has done a lot on converting the raw materials into fine finished products take the example of china chinese economy has boomed and behind that has been the success of the manufacturing sector the success of the human resources because china has invested in the human resources china has invested in bulk production bulk manufacturing and as a result we have seen that china's economy Chinese economy has grown over in the last few years right however now if we talk about India as well India definitely uh, the type of conditions that in which India got its independence were very grim they were very serious very bad you can say and the first concern of our governments back in those times was the welfare of the people and not earning profits now welfare of the people and that to a huge number it's really a tedious task I must say a Herculean one right now but when we talk about when gradually our country started progressing our country started getting self-sufficient in multiple things right in multiple domains then our focus also started shifting towards international markets competition from the international markets and all these kinds of stuff right now we see now we see and we see ourselves at a better stage if we talk about 
right for example uh, the campaign run by the present government and especially our respected prime minister shri narendra modi ji has always been you know focusing on make in india make in india right mean that means something that should be produced in india apart from that there are multiple projects like uh, if you talk about there is one more project called as one district one product that's the very uh, famous in uttar pradesh so every district is asked to contribute one speciality of its right so these are some of the great uh, you can say initiatives that have now the governments have also started realizing that such kind of initiatives will be a, a big booster for the manufacturing sector and apart from that when people learn to transform raw materials into more valuable products when people learn to add utility to the products utility to each and every stage of the raw material then somewhere or the other they get better prices for their products and whenever they are having better prices they are having much better opportunities to prosper to increase is their income and to take on other benefits right now apart from that india's prosperity lies in increasing and diversifying its manufacturing sector on the industries basically we cannot stick to the just traditional ones we need to explore new dimensions we need to explore the new uh, you can say horizons of the different industrial sectors or the different industrial units then only we'll be able to get the maximum out of it now whenever we talk about agriculture and industry at times people accuse the industry of taking up the jobs of the agriculture sector but that's not true right because if we see that industries and agriculture they share a bond they go hand in hand it's very important if we see the relationship the kind of relationship they share it's really incredible so here what we are going to do is we are going to really explore that relationship out we are going to understand that how industry and the agriculture they both go hand in hand now when we are talking about agriculture and industry they are not exclusive they are inclusive of each other which means very simple they move hand in hand like if i talk about the agro based industries in india they have given a major boost to agriculture by raising the productivity and how to come that productivity has risen it's very simple when we talk about let's let's take the example of green revolution when green revolution was introduced in india it demanded a whole lot of new technologies and new equipments now where these new equipments and technologies will come from definitely the manufacturing sector right the development of hyv seeds or if you talk about the modern agricultural tools for example let's talk about the machinery called combines threshers winnowers so all these are the products that have been produced by industry and over and over above they have helped to increase the productivity the overall productivity of the agricultural fields and that sounds really incredible isn't it now so they depend on the latter for the raw materials and sell their products like irrigation pumps fertilizers insecticides pesticides pvc pipes machines so all these are industry made products that somewhere or the other have helped the farmers the agriculturists to in expand their production isn't it now development and competitiveness of manufacturing industry has assisted in agriculture to increase their production but also it has made the production processes much efficient right so number 1 when the industries provide the much needed equipment to the people performing agriculture they are able to implement that in their respective fields and that some or the other directly or indirectly enhances their agriculture production now just uh, just you know just uh, take the example of a conventional plow right if we if we do if we do the plowing with a conventional plow it will take time but the same thing if attached to a tractor which is being like you can say produced in a factory or an industry the time and cost both will be reduced one time investment will be there but definitely if that one time investment will be like a fixed capital thing right that will give them revenue over and over again or that will give them benefits over and over again so these are some of the things which show that industries and the agriculture they always go hand in hand and apart from that there are many industries that are dependent upon agricultural raw materials for example there is a industry say that that produces wheat flour right in hindi you call that aata so that industry will definitely require wheat in the form of grains from the farmers from the agricultural fields so because that is a raw material or maybe a industry that produces bakery products maybe biscuits maybe breads they also require require wheat in the form of raw material so they are dependent indirectly or directly on the agricultural farms and the fields there so these are some of the ways in which we can say that agriculture and industry are interdependent on each other and also they are very much inclusive in their terms now someone somewhere asked me that how much have the industries contributed to the gdp of the country 
how much have the industries contributed to the economy of the country if someone asks you this question you have the answer you can state the answer well defined in points if you talk about the last two decades the share of the manufacturing sector has stagnated at 17% of the gdp out of the total 27% of the industry that includes 10% for mining querying and electricity and gas however this figures have little bit stagnated at 17% contribution of the total gdp right but if you talk about uh, still in the uh, different sectors if you like for example let's talk about information technology it sector and electronic sector so there you will see the much needed foreign income is earned by that sector only so basically this is like an aggregate number but again if you talk if you segregate them we'll gradually see as we move forward in the topic as we move forward in the chapter so we'll gradually come across that as long as we just you know just we'll get into this we'll come to know that uh, there are multiple dimensions to explore and there are multiple uh, industries that have contributed to the economy in their own term now this is definitely much lower in comparison to some east asian economies where the contribution is 25 to 35 percent but the trend of growth rate in manufacturing over the last decade has been seven percent per annum the desired growth however is 12 percent per annum but still it is growing now there is again uh, now there must be a question mark in your head right sir what is the reason behind the stagnated growth right we though 17 percent is not bad it has contributed enough right it has contributed good but we are talking about better and best so basically what's the problem lying here so if we talk about there are multiple industries in india where the final processed output is not reached has not reached a desired level or maybe some in in between processes are you can say hindering a lot so these are some of the shortcomings that are prevalent in each and other segment in each and every segment but definitely we are trying to overcome that right now since 2003 if you talk about manufacturing has one again started to grow at a speed of 9 to 10 percent per annum so we saw that it was growing steadily at a growth of 7 percent per annum but if you talk about last decades it has started to grow at 9 to 10 percent per annum now with proper policy interventions by the government and renewed efforts by industry to improve the productivity economists have predicted that if you talk about the total product that is if you talk about the total desired percentage that we are expecting that is 12 percent per annum definitely the industrial sector will be able to achieve that and now you see that multiple startups are coming earlier if you talk about 20 years back if you talk about two decades back people did not know about startups in india Startup culture is booming. It's mushrooming in the country. You see that lots and lots of startups are there. Recently, if I talk about recently, Bits Pilani has given, a, uh, I think, an year off to the students to you know, put in their own startups. So startup culture is somewhere or the other grooming or mushrooming in India. And that's really positive with respect to the multiple industries, the multiple segments with which it is operating. So earlier, we were very much stagnated with, you know, being a job seeking economy. So we are very much stagnated with that perspective that we are a job seeking economy we want to do jobs of higher packages but this mindset is gradually changing and uh, there has been government in interventions we have been government initiatives over the period of time i'm not talking about just one government I'm talking about all the governments that have come so far some of the other initiatives that they have taken has definitely promoted the industrial growth in the country now for instance if we talk about the national manufacturing competitive council nmcc so that has been set up with the objective in order to introduce the much needed reforms in the manufacturing sector and the much needed boost that needs to provide it to the manufacturing sector so that it can grow out in the best form right now moving on further if you talk about what effects the location of an industry so what are the factors that affect the location of an industry that's again a big question because suppose if you are planning to set up any kind of industry you know we are just having a healthy discussion here right so understand just like a discussion don't understand it like a class it's a basic discussion that i'm having with you all right just like in a class just forget about the classroom we are not here even in the classroom right so we are just imagine we are sitting somewhere in an outer space outer space here doesn't mean i'm talking about the real outer space okay so here i'm talking about uh, maybe a uh, 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 maybe a grassland maybe a park maybe a playground so we are sitting somewhere there and we are just discussing the industries and have you ever wondered whenever you visit a park a children's park maybe so there are swings all across those swings are also produced somewhere or the other in some kind of industries only so whatever we see across whatever we see around ourselves 
Like for example, let me take the instance. Let me take the example of this is stylus itself. The stylus of the pen. This has also been produced in some kind of industry that manufactures electronic products, right? Or if I talk about this kind of presenter I'm having, so this has also been prepared in or manufactured in some kind of industry only that prepares electronic gadgets, isn't it? Or maybe the board which I'm teaching upon. We have moved so you know we have transitioned from the simple chalk and duster board to the digital boards. Now this is the transformation we have witnessed. Why? Because the industries have boomed. The industries have transitioned. The industries have transformed, and they have transformed the way we are living now. They have transformed our experience with respect to multiple fields, isn't it? So we need to think on a broader approach, and this is what I expect from you all. I know you are a you are a lovely audience. and uh, that is what i always wish you to be light till the end of the video and yeah let's get back to the topic so basically when you're talking about the industrial location let's if you're planning to open an industry any time soon then this is for you right so if you're planning to start an industrial uh, industry so what 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 are the major perspectives that we need to keep into mind availability of the raw material labor capital power and the market see the first and the first most one is the availability of raw material suppose you find a location where that is very close to market that has all the power supply needs that has the required number of infrastructure that should be present but it lacks the availability of raw materials so until and unless you don't have the raw materials how are you going to manufacture a final product every other factor of production will not be productive until and unless you have the supply of raw materials right so availability of raw materials becomes a prerequisite of starting any industry so after industrial activity starts urbanization follows and that's very very common so what we can see is when when we talk about industries it will definitely have workers and generally what happens these workers they come up from far away places it's very difficult for these guys to go that uh, go back to the place and again come back the next day suppose if a person is coming from 80 kilometers far it's very difficult for a person to travel roughly 160 160 70 kilometers in a day you know to and fro so basically that kind of person will definitely like to settle somewhere nearby the industry or the factory which the person is employed in now such kind of you know a common mindset there's a huge number of people who are possessing the same kind of mindset same kind of thinking because all want to sort out their problems so generally it has been seen over the periods of time in ever since the ancient times industrial periods that wherever the industries have come up there always have been inhabited by the people around that means industries are always followed by the setting up of urban towns and cities so generally what happens the population starts settling around the industries because of the proximity to their workplace definitely they all want to stay near to the workplace so they don't have to waste or exhaust themselves in traveling from here and there so this is all the people love to do isn't it and gradually this gatheration of people has further turned into a big urban center or a big urban town okay so we have already seen that multiple times in history cities provide the markets and also the services like banking insurance transportation labor consultants financial advisors so all these kinds of services are available in the cities that are very much required in an industrial sector many industries no this one is important because this has been asked in one markers so please make a note of it that what are agglomeration economies right so please make a note of it that what are agglomeration economies now there are many industries which come together to make the best advantages that are offered by the urban cities or the urban centers now such kind of economies are called as agglomeration economies okay so that's an important one mark up please make a note of it that's really very very important okay now let's get started so what are the different factors that impact the location of any kind of industry number one if i talk about the cost of obtaining the raw materials at the site then what is the total cost for which you can procure the raw materials bring them back to the site then how will you what will be the cost that you are going to incur while uh, you are going to distribute your production apart from that cost of production at the site what is the total cost of production taking into consideration each and everything right and finally if we talk about decision to locate the factory at site so there are multiple places multiple factors that come into play whenever we are finding an ideal location so when we are whenever we are finding an ideal location we'll always look for a place that has good availability of raw materials very much proximate to the market that is very much nearby situated to the market and also to the urban center so that any kind of infra boost if you need that is available very readily so these are the multiple factors that we can always talk about now we see that industries they always have a market linkage now this very diagram is from ncrt's book itself okay so when you talk about the raw materials so inputs are the raw materials or the components 
Then we have the factors of production, the land, labor, capital, and entrepreneur. You have learned about them in your class 9th itself. If not, if you don't remember, let me tell you very simple. So land is something on which you require to build up. Like for example, I'll need land to set up my factory or my industry. Labor, I need skilled labor as well as unskilled labor to perform various tasks at the industry. Capital can be in two forms. Number one, when you're talking about capital, we are talking about some kind of investment that we are making, right? Now that investment can be on a temporary basis or on a permanent basis. When I'm talking about permanent, that can be in the form of buying up machinery, buying up land for a particular thing. So that is called my fixed capital. That one time I've invested and getting the returns over a great period of time. But there are raw materials that I need to purchase very frequently. There are miscellaneous expenses that I need to manage on a day to day basis. Such kind of investments are very temporary and very usual. Okay, and very regular, I must say. So very frequent uh, uh, kind of investments. We can keep them in the category of in the category of which type of investment? Any any guesses in the in the any guesses in the comment section? Any guesses in the comment section? Okay, no guesses. Working capital, right? So working means something that goes on. So working capital and the fixed capital. I'm just telling you the basics. How a capital has multiple dimensions. Now entrepreneur, the guy who mulches everything up, the person who just manages everything, who just uh, collaborates with all the factors of production, and produces the final goods. So these are very important apart from that if you talk about we need transportation services and then we have a factory then we'll get the final products and then the final products again need to be transported back to the market which will finally fetch you the money and once you have the money again the process restarts. So once you have the money you have spend it to buy raw materials you put in all the factors of production together apart from that you need transportation to reach your raw materials to the factory from factory the final products will be again reached out with the help of transportation to the market market after you sell the products that is again going to fetch you the money and the process keeps on repeating so there's a great kind of you can say industry linkage here so transportation if you see transportation is a kind of service isn't it then factory when you talk about it's coming in the industrial sector so we see that market will not be productive without the existence of industries and industries will also have a tough time if the markets do not exist and apart from the markets there are multiple infrastructural services that provide the much needed boost and the much needed link between the two kinds of segments okay now so we have come a far way so definitely before we move forward i would li like you all to answer a question okay a very very simple one you just need to define me what is manufacturing so i'll give you sufficient amount of time for this you can take your time to write down the answer you can write it right here in the lecture or you can write it post when you have already watched the entire video right so my question is very simple that what do you mean by manufacturing that's all you have to answer that's all easy one right easy peasy lemon squeezy yeah that's an easy one okay so now as everything is classified we all know that whenever you're talking about anything we classify things isn't it in the same way we see that our industries are also classified in one or the other way okay now let's try to understand what how do we classify it. so number one we classify them on the basis of the raw materials used now on the basis of raw material we classify them into agro based and mineral based okay so we classify them into agro based and agro based and mineral based see the name itself tells a lot about both the kinds of industries when you're talking about agro base agro here comes from the word agriculture so basically the industries that are taking up agricultural products as the raw materials they will be categorized under the agro uh, the agro base industries now secondly if we talk about secondly if we talk about the mineral base so basically all those industries that take into consideration that utilizes the raw materials that form a part of mineral uh, base sector or the minerals Right, so that is basically we can categorize such kind of industries into mineral based or let me make it more simpler for you. So the industries that use minerals as the raw materials, they can be called as your mineral based industries. It's very simple, right? Amazing, isn't it? Okay, few examples we can look upon. Cotton industry, woolen industry, jute, silk, textile, rubber, sugar, tea, coffee, all such kind of industries they take raw materials from agricultural fields, from agriculture itself right or the primary sector so basically they are agro based now when you talk about iron steel cement industry aluminium machine tools petrochemicals such kind of industries that take raw materials from minerals now next 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 category we have is according to the main role that is basic or key industries that supply products or raw materials to manufacture other goods 
For example, if we talk about iron and steel, iron and steel will supply the raw materials to some other industries to make maybe utensils, to make uh, engine parts, to make anything. For example, if you talk about a car manufacturing plant or an automobile industry, so automobile will definitely utilize iron and steel to produce cars, isn't it? Now, this is a kind of industry that is providing some other industry the much needed raw material, okay? So they can be called the basic or key industries. And then we have consumer industries. Consumer industries are very simple. So they are producing goods that can finally be used by the consumers. Now the consumers don't have to do anything to transform them into another form. So they have already done the finished products. They have already made the finished products. So consumer oriented or consumer based industries are the ones that produce products for direct use of the consumers. Okay. Now let's move further. So now let's talk about on the basis of capital investment. So what is the kind of money that you have invested? So based upon that, we have basically divided them into uh, small scale and large scale industries, right? So when you talk about small scale industries, here we, this is notable that when we are talking about the investment, this is less than one CR, less than one CR, one CR is one crore, right? That is less than one CR. And if you talk about the large scale industries here, the investments made are more than one CR. Okay. The investments made are more than one CR. So that's a very simple way to remember small scale and uh, small scale and large scale. In small scale, the investments are made are less than one crores. And when you talk about large scale industries, the investments made are more than one crore. So a small scale industry is defined with the maximum investment that is made is somewhere around one CR or one crore, but not more than that generally. But when you're talking about large scale industries, we are talking about the investment that is more than one CR or one crore, then it will be called as your large industry or large scale industry. Now, if you talk about on the basis of ownership, it's the easiest way to understand. On the basis of ownership, we have divided the industries into, we have divided the industries into public sector, private sector, joint sector and cooperative sector. Now, let's understand, let's break it and understand into very simple terms. Whenever the word public comes, right, whenever you hear the word public, very simply you must need to understand we are talking about the government. So these are basically the industries that are under the government ownership, so all the kind of government agencies, all, all the government PSUs. So these are basically those companies, those industries that fall under the public sector. Whenever you are talking about public sector, public sector has a less of profit motive and more of public welfare motive. But when we come to private sector industries, so private sector like Bajaj, Reliance, Tata, Adani Group, and Tata Iron Steel Company, Tesco. So all these are country, uh, all these are companies, not the countries. So they are part of a country, in fact. Okay, that means they uh, basically belong from our country only. So that was, chalo. So let's, let's move forward. Okay, so what I was talking about here is, when we are talking about private sector industries, so they are basically those companies, they are basically those industries that generally are controlled by some private individuals. Here the, they will be regulated by the government norms, that is fine. But the ownership is not in the hands of government. Here the ownership is in the hands of a private person or an individual person. Now, when we talk about joint sector industries, basically these industries are very much helpful whenever we are talking about some bigger projects. You know, government cannot finance all the big projects all by itself because this that, that bears a cost, right? So at times where government wants to do something very good, it has a project in mind, but somewhere or the other, it needs better finances. Their government asks the private sector to collaborate and such kind of public private, ship, uh, private sector model is uh, pretty much in boom nowadays. Right, so when you're talking about joint sector ventures or joint sector industries, so here we see that they are the industry that are jointly run by public and plus private. That means government plus the private individuals. All India Limited is a very good example of the same. Cooperative sector industries are basically owned by the producers or suppliers of either the raw materials or some kind of goods, right? Now, let's understand cooperative in a very simple manner. Suppose if I plan, if I, if I had a plan in my mind to start, begin a startup, okay? And I want some kind of funds from you guys. I said that, come on, let's be partners in my business. And suppose I ask five of you to so give me some funds and I'll also put in some funds from my own, you can say, khazana or from my own, you can say like uh, whatever I'm having in my bank accounts. So basically together, we suppose we are five people, including me. Okay, so four you and five, fifth one is me. So we pulled up our resources and somehow we managed to collect 50 lakh rupees. Okay, and with those 50 lakh rupees, we started a business. 
Now, whatever the losses are there, whatever the benefits are there, that will be equally shared amongst us. That such kind of uh, setup is called as a cooperative, where different people, they come together, they pool their resources, they share their resources, they start something, they start a business, they start a venture, okay, a new format can be anything. And whatever the profits, whatever the losses are there, they are equally shared and divided. And each member of the cooperative is equally important. So whenever the member is in need, the member is also helped out. So such kind of ventures are called as the cooperative sector industries. Okay. Or cooperative sectors or cooperatives. Now, and apart from that, based on the bulk and weight of the raw material, the finished goods, we have heavy industries that take into heavy raw materials like iron and steel. We have light industries that use light raw materials and produce goods like electrical industries and all. So depending upon the bulk of the raw material, the size of the raw material used, again we segregate industries in the form of heavy and light. Now this is a very important section from the chapter because people will definitely be asking and from people I hear definitely mean to refer to the examiners. Okay, so I'm just taking the term people for your comfort because from examiners will just you know you start getting altogether different kind of trauma and I don't want you people to be in that trauma. That's definitely not a real good side for me, isn't it? And definitely exams are something they just test your knowledge. That's all. I don't know at times people panic looking at the examination papers or the examination schedules, right? So however, examinations are something that are just asking you to present your knowledge in a much organized way. That's all. See, definitely we all maintain notebooks. Some of you don't do. In fact, I must also not have maintained at one point of time. Uh, I'm, I'm being brutally honest in this case. At one point of time, I won't mention the subject, but yeah, I did not maintain its notebook. However, later on, I realized the same and I felt very bad because in the examination, I lost marks because of that, because I did not have organized and concrete notes. So whenever we talk about examinations, whenever we're talking about exams, exams are nothing. People are afraid of exams. At times, we, you know, really uh, curse that guy who actually started this pattern of exams. But just imagine if there is no way to analyze your skills, Suppose we are very good at making notes, we are very good at doing something, but there must be some kind of parameter to analyze what kind of skills we are building, isn't it? There must be some kind of parameter to, you know, analyze what we are good at, what can be improved, what is better, because life is all about improvements. And the person who ceases to improve will always cease to evolve. That is a well-established fact. Learning and improvements, they always go hand in hand. You learn from any person around you, any person, that doesn't matter, the person is good and experienced, the person is, you know, elder to you, the person is younger to you, you have multiple, multiple ways to, you know, uh, learn. So if you ever see people who are really educated, who are really successful, who are really, really learned people, they have always, they have never missed an opportunity to learn from wherever they get what. So that is a special quality they perceive, this is a special quality they possess. Whenever people talk about being successful in life, whenever people talk about you know being great in life, if you like recently I was coming across this uh, interview, a clip of Ronaldo and Messi, I think there was a kind of award function, maybe the Golden Globe Award, something like this. Okay, so I'm not remembering the exa exactly what kind of function it was because I don't recall that, but so let me be very uh, precise to what I was talking about. Okay, so I saw this clip uh, that is uh, shared from one of these functions in which uh, Ronaldo, the interviewer, he asked Ronaldo a question that what kind of relationship do you share with Messi? And both are good, you know, there's no doubt about that. Both are greatest of all time. That's, that's really fact. Both are good, both are very competitive. So the reporter was very keen to know that what kind of relationship does uh, do you share with Messi? So, if you look at the answer, the way Ronaldo answered, that's really mesmerizing. I must say that. Because Ronaldo said that for the past 15 years, we have been sharing this stage. And he motivates me to do better and I motivate him to do better. So, that is the kind of relationship we share. We don't go out for dinner. We don't hang out together. But we have been there for the past 15 years. And that is the beauty of that competitive spirit. That is the beauty of the exams that they are giving. Because suppose, and it's not about just them. It's about the people who are crazy about them. It's about the fans who are crazy about them. Isn't it? If Messi scores a hat trick in a match, definitely the fans of Messi fans will be, you know, delighted with joy. But the same at the same point of time, you know, the Ronaldo's fans will be equally overjoyed because they know their player can do it. So that is the kind of confidence the people instill in them, the kind of faith the people have in both of them. And that makes them to do something better. 
ओके सो वेन पीपल हैव एक्सपेक्टेशन इन लाइफ वाई आई एम टॉकिंग एवरीथिंग इन मिट्स ऑफ दिस सो इट वॉज जस्ट आई रिमेंबर्ड अबाउट एग्जाम्स एंड यू नो हैवी एंड लाइट ऑल दोज थिंग्स सो वेन एवर पीपल दे हैव सर्टन एक्सपेक्टेशन इन लाइफ वाई डू दे हैव एक्सपेक्टेशन इज बिकॉज दे हैव अ बिलीफ इन अस दे बिलीव दैट वी हैव द पोटेंशियल और द कैपेसिटी टू डू दैट had they not believed it they would have never expected so we definitely at times we feel heavy when we talk about the load of expectations that people are having expectations from us so understand ask yourself a question why why are the people having expectations from you why did the people expect from ms dhoni that if he is standing right there in the world cup india is going to win the world cup why did they have because he had proven out to them he can do it so that is the kind of that is the kind of we can say spirit we need to have when you are going to give the examinations when you are going to ace any competition of your life any problem of your life just ask yourself a simple question am i capable of doing it why do people believe on me why are the people expecting out of me definitely i am capable of doing it the moment you realize the moment you get answer to this question believe me no one can stop you and that is the time will be unstoppable right so okay fair fill so let's just you know just get back to the topics it was you know it was a kind see whenever i discuss with you people so whenever i talk with you people because this is the platform where i come and you know i just love to speak to you people and that is the best part about it so however let's get back to the topic because we have lot to cover i'll come to such stories in the meanwhile okay so yeah but that that's a that's a beautiful platform you know this is a really beautiful platform where i get to share your thoughts where i get to share my thoughts what i feel and what you feel but what do you feel you can tell me through your comment section okay and i see i'm really disheartened to see that people do not make good use of it so that's my humble request please do make good use of the comment section if you have something to share you can share it constructive and positive that can help out people around if you have some questions to ask then please do ask it right so that is all yours that's a virtual connect between me and you now let's get it started now number one we will try to start with the agro based industries i mean the industries that are dependent upon agriculture for their raw materials for their final products that are they are going to process after the processing of the raw materials okay now if you talk about the textile industry it contributes 4% towards the gdp 4% right that's a good amount it's the only industry in the country which is self reliant and complete in the value chain that means from raw materials to the highest value added products all are compiled in this industry itself now it is the second largest employment generation sector in india after agriculture it directly generates an employment of 35 million people right can you imagine that's a huge number so after agriculture textile industry is the second most employment generating industry now with respect to textile let's let's get into deeper into cotton textiles industry now indian cotton has been in great demand ever since the time of the british even even before that and indians used to trade cotton overseas and indian uh, cotton was in huge demand in fact you won't believe but the indian cotton was of such a fine quality that when british uh, british cotton mills started way back in england back in 1800s they became so scared of the quality of the indian cotton that they forced the governments to restrict the import of cotton into britain because their industries were not able to produce the same quality of cloth or the fabric that indians were producing and the british market was full of the indian fabric because it was exported in great amounts and in fact the british used to import a good amount of indian fabric into the country that to at cheap rates so the local producers they got so much you can say they had such a kind of jealousy or animosity towards the indian cloth and then fabric that they compelled their governments to restrict the import of cotton now india producing the cotton textiles since ancient times with the help of hand spinning and hand looms after 18th century if we see with the advancement in technologies power looms came into the uses and the traditional industries that were using the mechanical methods or the physical labor that received a setback and reason was the introduction of power looms that were more far efficient okay far more efficient and far more productive you can say the numbers were better compared to the mechanically produced thing or manually produced thing the first successful textile mill was set up back in mumbai in 1854 okay so these are few quick pointers that you can always make notes in your notebook so while studying for the examination it will be easier for you so we talk about in the earlier years the cotton textile industry was concentrated in the cotton growing regions of maharashtra and gujarat 
And now this is a very good question. This question has been asked for three markers at times. Well, why in the initial years the cotton textile industry was concentrated in the cotton growing regions of Maharashtra and Gujarat? The reason being the availability of raw cotton, availability of raw material. Remember, industrial location, market's proximity, the market was very close. Transportation including accessible port facilities. It was very easy to uh, get the finished product transported to the ports and from ports it can be traded overseas. Apart from that, cheap labor, moist climate that was really good for the growth of cotton. So that was the reason that initially the cotton textile mills also were concentrated in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Right? So these were the positive factors that aided the growth of cotton textiles in India. Now, Spinning continues to be centralized. Spinning of the cotton yarn continues to be centralized in Maharashtra, Gujarat and Tamil Nadu. But if you talk about weaving, that is highly decentralized. Decentralized means that is much scattered in the different areas. So with respect to weaving, so basically weaving has allowed to incorporate the traditional styles along with the modern ones. For example, even today if you go to buy a Banarsi sari, okay or a cotton sari, a very fine cotton sari with some great embroidered borders. So those embroideries are generally done by hand and the ones done by hand or manual labor are comparatively costlier with respect to whatever is printed by machines. Now, India has a world class production in spinning but the weaving supplies low quality of fabric as cannot use much of the yarn produced. Now, this is a bigger problem in India. We have exceptional quality of spinning, spinning into a yarn. But that yarn could not be woven into a fine fabric. So we are lacking skills there. right? We are having really good skills with respect to spinning the yarns, making the thread out of those cotton balls, that cotton raw material. But we are not being able to convert that into a fine fabric. As a result of that, we have not been able to do much good in terms of weaving fabric. right? India exports yarn to Japan. And just imagine we are exporting the yarn to Japan. Japan with all the modern and advanced technologies, preparing it into weaving it into a fine fabric converting it into a ready-made product or ready-made garment and then selling it back to us. And this is the very common thing. If you talk about cotton, major cotton from India is exported. And these cotton yarns that are exported from India at a very cheap cost, they go into outside into big, big companies, probably multinational corporations. They have their own quality standards. They weave the yarn to a fine fabric. Okay, they're utilizing the raw material, the base from India and then selling it back at the price of 3,000, 4,000 rupees a shirt. Yeah, that's the cost of really fine cotton. If you talk about Egyptian Giza cotton, that's a long staple one. If you talk about Indian long staple cotton, so that is the kind of market price of a shirt that is woven out of that fabric. 3,000 to 4,000 rupees. I won't take the brand, brand's name, but if you go out in the mall, shop for a good fine cotton shirt, that is the minimum. The minimum amount you would get it for, it's rupees 2,000, not less than that. A fine cotton, a fine long staple cotton shirt. That is That, that are the high costs. Now, the country also exports, a country also exports cotton goods to US, UK, Russia, France, Eastern European countries, Nepal, Singapore, Sri Lanka and the African countries. So they are the different countries with which our countries uh, deals in exports and imports. Right? Basically we export the cotton to these countries and uh, some of them they make a good fabric out of it and somewhere or the other they sell their ent entirely exceptional fabric back to us. So India has the la second largest installed capacity of spindles. Again, this is a one marker question after China. Okay, so spindle is basically a kind of tool that is utilized in spinning or weaving the entire raw material into a thread like structure. So after China, India has the second largest installed capacity of spindles. India has the largest share in world trade of cotton yarn. If you talk about about one fourth of the total trade, about one fourth of the total cotton yarn trade, the, the share is captured by India itself. However, our trade in garments, that is the final products that we make it out of it, it's only 4% of the world's total. So that is really sad. If you talk about the, if you talk about the total production of the yarn, we contribute around about 25% of it. But if you talk about the final products in the form of garments, we just share a 4% of it. That is something that we need to work upon. That is something that really needs to be improved. Now, what are the problems that the cotton textiles have faced? This is a nice question. Can be asked in a long answer question, okay? So this is important. That what are the problems that have been faced by cotton textiles? Number one, irregular supply of electricity. That is very, very important. Electricity is really very important when it comes to, uh, like uh, basically when it comes to, you know, uh, running the machinery, when it comes to producing the products. And if you don't have the proper electricity arrangements, your machines are not going to work. Old and outdated machine, we need a real upgradation. We are still dealing in old and outdated machinery that is not able to produce as per the market demands and as per the market standards. Low output of the labor, here we are missing out on this as well. The labor is again not skilled and up to the mark 
of the requirement of the production that is actually required now moving away from that we are also facing tough competition from the synthetic fiber industry now synthetic fibers are comparatively if you talk about if we just let's take the example of polyester polyester jackets are comparatively cheap they are comparatively you know like uh, more uh, attractive at times so what is happening this cotton industry is again facing a stiff competition from the synthetic fibers because synthetic fibers are comparatively cheaper and uh, at times they also are looking attractive when compared to a basic cotton basic cotton product so there are multiple factors in which synthetic industries definitely synthetic fibers are giving a tough competition to the cotton industry so these are the different problems that the cotton industry is facing in the country now so here's a map right from the ncrd itself i know this is a smaller version of it so you can see here the different kinds of cotton textile woolen textile and silk textile industries the one marked in black you can see the dotted ones are the cotton textiles they can find it in Muradabad, then we have Kanpur, okay, then we have Murshidabad, then somewhere near Hooghly, then we have Vardha that lies in this particular central part of the country, then we have Aurangabad, Jalgaon, Indore, Devas, Ahmedabad, Mumbai, Surat, Pune, right, so these are the major, you can say, the cotton producing states, okay, then we have some parts in Agra as well, now apart from cotton producing cotton textiles, we have woolen textiles that are very much marked in the red diamonds. So Amritsar and Ludhiana are very famous for their woolen textiles and hosieries. We have the part of it in Srinagar as well. We have Panipat, Gunugaon, Bikaner, Jaipur. Then we have Gwalior, Shajapur, some part in Kanpur as well, some part in Mirzapur, Uttar Pradesh, right? Some parts in Mumbai as well, the nearby Rajkot and Jamnagar. So these are the various places where we can file these textile industries. So this is a nice and easy map. Okay. So just need to just go up, just need to follow the legend. Legend means here the different kinds of, uh, you can say markers that are denoting the different kinds of industry. So that's an easier one, but an important one. Okay. Now let's come to the jute textiles. India is the largest producer of raw jute and the jute goods. If you talk about majority of the jute mills are concentrated in the West Bengal region. And if you talk about, frankly speaking, before independence, India had a huge variety of jute producing areas, but post independence after India, Pakistan uh, partition, lot of the areas where the jute is produced they went into the domains of pakistan now uh, currently bangladesh right because eastern pakistan had already gained its independence so basically now most of them are found in bangladesh so that bengal section the that bengal belt is really very very useful when it comes to uh, the jute production and if you talk about the first jute mill that was set up back in 1859 at rishra in kolkata nearby the west bengal region okay now Factors that are responsible for location of jute in the Hooghly Basin. This is a very important long answer question. Please make a note of it. This has been asked in the board examination prior to this as well. That is why this makes it a very important one. Number one, why the most of the industries are concentrated in the Hooghly Basin or the Bengal region? The basic factor, the basic point is presence of the jute producing areas, inexpensive water transport. Hooghly serves as a very good medium of, uh, you know, supplying or transportation mediums. The river transport is comparatively very cheaper. It is supported by a good network of road, uh, railways, roadways and net, uh, network of waterways as well. So if you see Kolkata and the Bengal regions well connected by all the means of transport, you have some really good trains originating to and from the Kolkata and Bengal region. Now, abundant water for processing of jute because jute needs a huge amount of water for its processing because jute is extracted out of the bark of the trees, you know. From the bark, the fibers are separated, then dried, you know, then beaten up, then dried in sun, then some for some time it is said to, you know, uh, uh, it is said to leave in the flood water or the river water. So it's a huge, a tedious process to produce jute fiber, right? And it requires good amount of water for the same. So we have abundant amount of water available in the basin. Then cheap labor is available from West Bengal and the areas of UP, Bihar and Odisha that go to the areas to work as the laborers. Kolkata is a large urban center that provides all the important uh, infrastructural needs in the form of banking services, insurance services, and the ports facilities for the transportation of jute materials, right? So these are the multiple factors responsible for concentration of the jute industries in the Bengal region. Now, moving on further, what are the challenges faced by the jute industry? Number one, it is facing stiff competition in the national market from synthetic substitutes, again. And there are competitors like Bangladesh, Brazil, Philippines, Egypt and Thailand that are giving a tough competition to the jute industry in India. Again, jute is a little bit expensive when compared with the, when compared with synthetic fibers. If you talk about synthetic fibers, the jute 
it's comparatively expensive and definitely people consumers of india if you talk about they are more over price oriented consumers i'm not saying that people they do not go for quality people they do go for quality but not all how many the question lies here right so basically if we see that people are more over oriented towards price and comparatively the price of the synthetic products are little bit cheaper right now so if you talk about the national jute policy that was formulated back in 2005 so it had this objective of increasing the productivity of the jute improving the quality of the jute produced and ensuring that good prices are given to the jute farmers and also implementing the techniques and the different kind of strategies that can increase the per hectare yield or productivity of the jute so that the jute is very soon losing market to its substitutes and synthetic substitutes and the stiff competition so such things can be avoided such things can be very well mitigated and managed so that's why government has also stepped in with several policies in favor of the jute producing farmers okay now i have a question for you my question is very simple my question is give me two reasons why most of the jute producing areas are concentrated in bengal okay make a point of it my question is very simple give me two reasons why most of the jute producing uh, factories or jute textiles are concentrated in the areas of bengal you have all the time to yourself you can answer the question post the video gets over or once you have watched the video or you can again watch the video to like uh, reconsider the question again fine so with this let's meet move to kuch meetha ho jaye hai na so basically what happens when we are really happy when we are really really happy so it's an indian tradition to have something sweet and from sweet how can we forget sugar right so sugar is something it's an indispensable part of the indian life because right in the morning whenever a fresh tree is uh, not the tree in fact the tea whenever fresh tea or coffee is brewed in homes coffee at times can be taken without sugar tea as well but tea is generally taken with sugar so basically sugar is a very important ingredient especially in the indian families now when we talk about sugar it is india has the second largest producer of sugar in the world first largest producer of gold and khansari okay so that's a great, remarkable achievement we must say that isn't it so when you talk about the ranking of india with respect to sugar india has the second largest producer of sugar in the world and first largest it is, it is in case of gold and khansari now Back in 2010 and 11, there were approximate 662 sugar mills in the country, and that was spread over UP, Bihar, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Gujarat, along with Punjab, Haryana, and MP. 60%, 60% of the sugar mills can be found in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar alone. Now, in recent years, if we see that the sugar mills have shifted to southern and western states, especially if we talk about Maharashtra. Now there are certain reasons behind that. If you talk about the raw material from which sugar is prepared, that is sugar cane. If you talk about sugar cane as a crop, it is a crop that takes almost an year to mature. And apart from that, maximum sucrose content of the entire sugar cane lies in the lower parts or the lower stalks of the crop. Now, if you see the crushing season, that is comparatively longer in the southern states of the country, and the climatic conditions are also more favorable. So now, what happens is. if we talk about the subtropical areas of the country so there the crushing season is very limited the crop produced is for very limited period of time as a result the sugar mills are not able to generate the maximum amount of it so as a result the mills have now started to shift towards the southern and the western parts of the country because they provide more suitable conditions for both production and the business perspectives right so the cane cane here means a sugar cane the sugar cane produced here has higher sucrose content cooler climate ensures long crushing season and apart from that the cooperatives here are more successful in the states you can say both the management and the production of the grain the production of the crop is very well managed and efficiently done with respect to the southern and western states as a result lots and lots of sugar mills have started to move towards these states now when we talk about them let's 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 finally come to the second part of the topic okay second part of the entire discussion that we are having right now So so far we discussed about the agro based industries i mean the industries that were heavily dependent on agriculture for their raw materials and products okay now we'll be discussing about the mineral based industries in very simple terms the industries that utilize minerals as the raw materials they are called as the mineral based industries now the first in the segment is the iron and steel the iron and steel industry is indispensable when it comes to being a key supplier or supporter of a number of other industries that are dependent upon iron and steel for producing their raw materials 
right now when you talk about iron and steel industry it is a basic industry as it provides machinery to the other kind of industries because without the machineries the other kind of industries also won't be able to perform their functions isn't it now when you talk about steel steel is needed to manufacture a variety of engineering goods construction material defense equipments you know we have steel uh, surgical grade steel that is used to prepare surgical equipments for the medical purposes telephonic scientific equipments and lots of consumer goods production and consumption of steel is often regarded as an index of country's development if a country is good producing good amount of steel consuming good amount of steel as well that means countries other sectors are growing especially the ones dependent upon steel and iron so that's a indicator of the same india ranked fourth among the world on refined steel producers and largest producer of sponge iron right so that's a great achievement china however the largest producer of steel and also the world's largest consumer of steel the reason behind the being the largest consumer is because china is a great manufacturing hub it manufactures for a huge number of multinational brands all around the globe so china owes a lot of you can say steel it basically with respect to these industries as well in 2004 india was the largest exporter of steel so that's a great achievement you can say again so back in the 2004 times india was our largest exporter of steel so these are some of the data the factual data you just need to remember them now why iron and steel is a heavy industry the question is like this that why iron and steel is really a heavy industry so we have very simple answer to it number 1 all the raw materials as well as the final products or the finished goods they are very much heavy and bulky in nature isn't it and they need huge transportation cost to transfer it from one place to another chota nagpur plateau in the region has the maximum number of iron and steel industries if someone ask you which region in the country has the maximum number of iron and steel industries so that is your chota nagpur plateau region okay now india now question arises why has india not been able to perform to its full potential in terms of iron production what is the reason lying behind that number 1 high cost and limited availability of a cooking coal cooking coal is used in the blast furnaces for smelting of iron right lower productivity of labor irregular supply of energy and poor kind of infrastructure so these are the major hindrances there are the major shortcomings that have led to you can say underperformance of the india's iron and steel segment India has a great potential but it has not been able to perform up to its potential because of the different factors the lower productivity of labor high cost then irregular power supply poor infrastructure right however when you have liberalized the trade that means opened the trade barriers and allowed other companies to you know set up their plants in india and with the help of foreign direct investment that means when a foreign company tries to set up a plant in the country or invest in a country's local project that's called fdi so they have given a boost to the industry with the efforts of some private individuals jumping into the scene right earlier otherwise if we leave it compare like completely towards a public sector the things are not going to work now with the intervention of the private players we can see that the iron steel has witnessed a certain amount of growth i must not call that exponential but still we are improving at a far better rate okay now what else so here is a quick flow chart that defines how the process of steel manufacturing is completed let's try to go through it so basically if you see that when first we do first we transport the raw material to the plant okay first the raw material is transported to the plant then we take it to the blast furnace so iron ore here is melted limestone is added to it okay and slag or whatever impurity is present that is also removed now coke is again coke is a kind of coal you can say i'm not talking about the coca cola here so coke again is a variety of coal so that is burned to heat the ore to produce the heat there okay now pig iron so molten materials are poured into molds these are the shaping molds okay so these molds are called as pigs and the subsequent outcome is called as the pig iron or the cast iron now shaping metal again rolling pressing and casting is done of what uh, like basically so what we do number 1 we have transported the raw material to the plant post that what we have done we have melted the iron ore we have added limestone to it so whatever impurities are there that are removed again coke is burned to in expedite that heating process finally whatever molten material is there that is present uh, that is poured into molds molds you can say are structures you can say like you have seen a cake mold in which we pour that raw material of the cake then we bake it and then we get the final shape so such kind of structures where we can pour a certain amount of something and get it out into a shape right so these are the molds so that is the molten materials are poured into molds they are called pig and the subsequent iron is also called as pig iron now after that the steel pig iron is further purified by melting it and oxidizing the impurities 
मैंगनीज निकल एंड क्रोमियम आर एडेड एंड वंस दे आर एडेड फाइनली वी स्टार्ट प्रोसेसिंग इट इन द फॉर्म ऑफ रोलिंग इन द फॉर्म ऑफ शीट्स और वट एवर इज द रिक्वायरमेंट एंड देन दिस इज हाउ द स्टील इज मेड सो स्टील इज नॉट अलोन द आयरन ओर बट आयरन ओर मिक्स विद सर्टन आर एंड अदर मिनरल्स और सर्टन अदर मेटल्स राइट एंड दैट गिव्स द स्ट्रेंथ दैट गिव्स द आयरन दैट गिव्स द स्टील इट्स स्ट्रेंथ एंड द मच नीडेड प्रॉपर्टीज so if we we'll have a look at the graph here at the pi i'll just have a look at the bar graphs here so this shows the steel production in india and china right where the china is marked in purple and india is marked in light blue so let's take the recent years if we talk about 2011 the uh, the in china the steel production was 683.2 million tons however in india it was only 72.2 million tons so that's it says that itself shows that china is way ahead in terms of steel production okay now Let's come to the next important industry that is aluminium smelting. Okay, aluminium smelting is second most important metallurgical industry in India. Metallurgical here means where the metals are refined and given a final form. We can say or a finished product form. Okay, so the raw material that is used in the smelters is the bauxite, out of which we manufacture aluminium. So bauxite is a bulky, dark reddish colored rock, out of which aluminium is extracted. Okay, it's a very aluminium is basically a light resistant to corrosion a good conductor of heat malleable and it becomes very strong when it is mixed with other metals now this is used to manufacture aircraft parts utensils wires because of its excellent properties of malleability and ductility and as well as it becomes very strong when we mix it with other metals as well so it has really gained property as a substitute for steel copper zinc and lead in a number of industries So if we talk about the major bauxite producing areas, so they are more over concentrated in the areas of Odisha, West Bengal, okay, Kerala, UP, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, and Tamil Nadu. So these are the major belts from where you can extract bauxite, and out of the bauxite we prepare the aluminium. So there is a flow chart again so from your NCA RT itself. So that shows the process of manufacturing of aluminium in the industry. So if you see the amount, four to six tons of bauxite is needed to produce two tons of alumina, and from that only one ton aluminium is produced. So you can see that out of four to six tons of bauxite rock, we are able to produce only one ton of aluminium. Now, how the process goes about? Let's take a sneak peek. Now, the raw material that is the taken out from the bauxite quarry, transported with the help of railways or ship. Now, the bauxite is crushed and alumina is taken out or alumina is dis uh, dissolved out in an aluminium refinery. Now, the bulk ore is shipped. The bulk ore that means the maximum quantity, the heaviest quantity, is shipped to the smelting area where it could be burned and further processed. Then calcinated petroleum coke from a refinery is added to it and pitched from a colliery. Finally, what happens? It goes into the aluminium smelter. Now, here the cryolite that is a molten metal, it acts as a it acts as a electrolyte and further initiates the process. Further helps out in the process. And finally, you know, per ton of ore, approximately eighteen thousand six hundred kilowatts of electricity is also required. So, combining all these elements, we are finally able to extract the aluminium. So, it's a hectic process. You can see here itself. The raw bauxite is further taken to, you know, to first extract alumina out of it. Then that alumina is further processed. Okay, then further smelted again with the additions of several minerals and cryolite to expedite the process. Okay, then finally we are able to extract the aluminium. So we see that out of four to six tons of bauxite, we are able to extract two tons of aluminium, and from that we are finally able to convert it into just one ton of aluminium. So that's uh, we can say a great amount of wastage is also included here, right? So we are not able to extract uh, three tons or four tons of aluminium out of it. So from six, we are able to extract only one. Now let's move forward towards the chemical industry. chemical industry is again a very fast and diversified industry in india it's fast growing one it contributes to 3% of the gdp that's a good number it contributes to 3% of the gdp it is the third largest in asia and 12th largest globally in terms of its size so again that's a great contribution now it comprises of both large scale and small scale manufacturing units When we talk about the chemical industries, we have both are kinds of chemicals produced in the country. We have organic ones and the inorganic ones. Okay. Whenever you talk about the word organic, it definitely says the origins of the chemicals have some or the other kind of life forms involved in it. When you talk about in inorganic, basically these kinds of things are devoid in the entire composition. So when you're talking about the organic chemicals, we include the petrochemicals. 
right that is utilized for manufacturing the synthetic fibers i mean fibers that are produced in the factory by synthetic process or artificial processes by for producing synthetic rubber plastics dyes dyes are used to color something then drugs doesn't mean the intoxicating elements hey. drugs means here the medicines we are talking about okay so the organic chemicals are so here the organic chemicals are utilized for the manufacturing of multiple things like synthetic fibers plastics okay pharmaceuticals when we talk about inorganic chemicals they include the sulfuric acid the sulfuric acid is used to manufacture fertilizers synthetic fibers in some case adhesives something like fevicol that you would use it for your art and crafts paints you know that with that you used to paint your house beautiful paint your house right then we uh, use it like for example other examples we have nitric acid alkali soda ash that is used to make glass okay soaps and detergents paper and caustic soda so these are the inorganic chemicals so we see that chemical industry number one it contributes in three percent of gdp apart from that we have both the kinds of chemicals available organic and inorganic sectors of chemicals right so in organic we are mostly preferring to the petrochemicals that are utilized for multiple purposes when you talk about inorganic chemicals we are most probably dealing in sulfuric acids nitrates alkalis right soda ash so that are used in manufacture of glass uh, soap the basic toilet soaps that you use it out okay so there we see that there's a multiple kind of usage and this industry is again fast growing one so now apart from this we have fertilizer industry now fertilizers are really very much you can say very important with respect to the agriculture because there are farmers who have been using fertilizers for you can say more uh, expedited growth right so mainly centered around the production of nitrogenous fertilizers if we talk about the fertilizer industry in india so this is mainly centered around producing nitrogenous fertilizers like for example urea phosphatic fertilizers and ammonium phosphate that's dap and some very complex fertilizers that are combination of nitrogen phosphate and potash so these are the central areas with which the fertilizer industry is working at present India is the third largest producer of nitrogenous fertilizers. Now these rankings are good. So what you need to do is, I'll just tell you a simple hack. What you need to do, just make a chart. Okay, write down India's rank with respect. Just write down all the industries. Write down the rank. So you'll easily remember what are the ranks of India and what are the who are the leading producers. Because definitely a question is going to be asked from this particular perspective of the chapter. Okay, so it's very important that you should know what, what is India's ranks in a certain kind of industry or certain kind of sector. Okay, now, fertilizer industry in India is again segregated into several units. Like we have 57 fertilizer units for producing nitrogenous and complex fertilizers. We have 29 units for producing urea, 9 for producing ammonium sulfate and 68 other small units for producing the single superphosphate fertilizer. So these are the various units into which the fertilizer industry is divided or bifurcated or you can say fercated into many segments. Main states that have this industry are Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, UP, Punjab and Kerala. So these are the major states that own this industry. Now it's a very simple way to learn the states. Let me tell you a small trick here. Okay, like if you talk about Gujarat, then we have Gujarat, then we have Tamil Nadu, then we have UP, okay, so you can just make a simple initial from this, GTU, okay, GTU, so GTU, like we have GTS and Andreas game, there's a new game called GTU, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, UP, it's very easy, you can, you can just, you know, you can make anything out of it. You can make anything out of it. You can make that in Hindi even if you are comfortable with. So in Hindi you get more ideas at times. Doesn't matter. I mean in your local language also. Whichever language you are most comfortable with. Okay. If I am uh, like in Hindi. Like uh, being my mother tongue. I may be comfortable in that. Or I may be speaking Punjabi. So if you are very comfortable in speaking Punjabi. Or any other beautiful language of the country. You are very free to make a mnemonic out of it. Because end of the day you just need to remember. Okay. So there are no like compulsions. You need to stick to one language. It's nothing like that. Okay. So GTU you can remember by anything. Anyway. Like uh, you can remember by th three simple letters. Or you can just make a mnemonic out of it. From G we do we have any, anything tasty to eat. Anything. I don't remember anything with G. Mm, something and something garlic bread yeah garlic bread garlic bread we can call it as toasted garlic bread uh with 
umbrella no not at all we can cannot have it with umbrella right so toasted garlic bread with something okay so anything you can any any okay toasted garlic bread for you fine so we finally made out of it okay toasted garlic bread for you toasted garlic bread for you garlic bread toasted for you it's very simple gujarat tamil nadu up or you can simply remember it as gtu so these kinds of mnemonics they help you a lot in remembering the states so i just told you an example because i was just making instantly right here right now so if you have a ample amount of time you can make better better mnemonics out of it other significant producers are andhra pradesh odisha rajasthan bihar maharashtra west bengal goa delhi mp and karnataka so there are multiple states to go for right now let's talk about the cement industry another important one cement is used for construction purposes we all know that for all the kind of infrastructure cement is most inevitable you can't build infrastructures without the very good uses of cements isn't it for building a bridge for building a dam for building a hospital for building a school for constructing an office building for everything you need cement as the binding material right so industry requires bulky and heavy raw materials like limestone silica alumina gypsum so they are the prerequisites of the industry and this if you talk about the industry is very much located in the uh, like parts of gujarat okay now the first cement plant was set up in chennai back in 1904 this is a one marker question very important one it has been asked previously in the exams as well that where was the first cement plant set up so the first cement plant was set up in chennai back in 1904 1904 now decontrol of price and distribution since 1989 and other policy reforms they have led to the improvements in the cement industry otherwise earlier it was very much licensed and in the hands of only few people now this has been distributed the rights have been very much distributed and also there have been government reforms and policies that have provided the much needed boost to the uh, cement industry now if we talk about the industry it's doing very well in terms of export as well as in terms of uh, production you must be very much fascinated by that uh, ad if i remember bhangar cement or there was one more ad भैया ये दीवार टूटती क्यों नहीं है अंबुजा सीमेंट से जो बनी है ओके सो दे आर मल्टीपल आर्ट शो केसिंग द पावर ऑफ द माइट ऑफ द सीमेंट इज इंटेड सो सीमेंट इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इंडस्ट्री नाउ लेट्स मूव फर्दर विद दिस ओके सो हे कम्स द ऑटोमोबाइल ऑटोमोबाइल टू बी वेरी स्पेसिफिक वी एट टाइम्स कॉल दिस एज ऑटोमोबाइल बट बट दैट इज नॉट द राइट वे टू गो अबाउट दिस दैट्स एन ऑटोमोबाइल इंडस्ट्री ओके सो ऑटोमोबाइल इज बेसिकली इट्स मोर you can say connected with respect to production of cars and the comfortable luxury transports so we all love to you know stroll around in the cars we all love to go for late night drives and they are really amazing and to add to the amazement if we get a scoop of ice cream that adds to the entire you can say you know the kind of joy we are experiencing overall so the industry provides vehicles for quick transport for good services and passengers we see that in the past 15 years automobile industry in india has really gained a good amount of growth apart from that if we see the fdi foreign direct investment there are many companies of their many global brands that they have set up their plants in india and they are manufacturing the cars in india they are operating from india and in fact exporting from india even this kind of investment has given the much needed boost to the automobile industry in india we have 15 manufacturers of passenger cars and multi utility vehicles nine manufacturers of commercial vehicles and we have 14 manufacturers of the two and three wheeler vehicles so our automobile industry we can definitely say has definitely grown a lot in terms of both production and exports now let's come to a very favorite of mine that is the it industry so we see a very good example of it industry here. so earlier who could have imagined 10 or 12 years back that we would be studying or virtually being connected with the help of youtube right and there must be classes on all together a virtual classroom being run on youtube early youtube was supposed to be a luxury now with the you can say that uh, with the advancement in the technologies and the internet cost getting comparatively cheaper now youtube is reachable to each and every one and this has transformed the entire way which uh, by through which the youtube is conceived isn't it so we we could have never imagined that but now it's possible isn't it so if we talk about the electronics industry even it covers a wide range of products from transistor to television telecom smartphones telephone exchanges radars computers and many other equipments that are required by multiple uh, industries isn't it like suppose just imagine i can like simply you know write with an electronic pen here that's an electronic gadget prepared by an electronic industry i don't need a physical chalk here to write on the board simply this board can sense the kind of you know uh basically the kind of gestures i'm making and accordingly it is responding me back so that's the entire magic of this telecom not the telecom the entire magic of this entire electronic industry isn't it now 
if you talk about bangalore is considered to be the electronic capital of india and also the silicon valley of india other important centers for electronic goods are mumbai delhi hyderabad pune chennai kolkata lucknow and coimbatore that are famous for the electronic goods isn't it so nowadays we are having the very advanced smartphones we are having very advanced laptops all thanks to the electronic industry that has been uh, you know working or toiling hard ever since a long time now apart from that if we talk about the it sector the information technology industry that is concentrated in bangalore noida mumbai chennai hyderabad and pune so they are the big cities the big cities where the major it giants are there noida is progressing at a rapid rate you must uh, like uh, have come across multiple companies opening up in noida apart from that if you talk about gurgaon is famous for its it hub for its id sector bengaluru forever right bengaluru is famous for its silicon valley and there are multiple multiple giants coming up in the country in fact so it industry you can say has employed a good number of indian graduates there are lots of iitns there are lots of people turning out from very good colleges joining these it industries okay so there are offices there are you know setups of multiple global brands even like google and microsoft in the country in these big cities and people are employed into that so these cities they provide a very good base for such talented graduates such talented it skills people so industry has been a major foreign exchange earner remember we started we talked about this in the beginning of the video that the major foreign exchange earner has been the uh, it industry okay now because of its fast business process outsourcing of the bpo sector now if we see the cities like delhi and noida they provide a good base for the call centers as well there are huge number of people employed in call centers and who are just looking after the back end services of the big brands all around the globe so that you can say that it has generated a huge amount of employment especially with respect to the people who are educated and who are skilled so it has basically employed lot of that skilled labor all around now so we have done enough of the types of industries we have done enough of the classification of industries we have done enough of the glorification of industries now it's time for some constructive criticism okay why i'm saying constructive criticism because we have to learn from our mistakes it's very important until and unless you learn from your mistakes you'll never come across what mistakes have you made and definitely industries have contributed with respect to the development part but at the same cost at the same time they've also contributed to environmental pollution and degradation so when you talk about the growth of industries they have definitely contributed to india's economic growth but they have also contributed to several forms of pollution and when we are talking about the big cities like delhi noida chennai and all so they are also facing some great and huge environmental problems so i still you know i whenever i get up in the morning what i see is not fog i what i see is smog right from the balcony of my apartment when i walk uh, i basically keep my doors and windows closed the reason behind being the poor air quality that's outside but somewhere or the other you have to cope with it so people have started living with it right so, so the times are very good when it's the summer season or the light winters but as the winters ushers in in the full might you see that you must have come across a news channels you know where the delhi ncr is having a very poor air quality that is in severe category and definitely it affects you yeah, like when you go outside there's irritation in the eyes or several health problems that you can always face so basically they have paid a cost every every Uh, you can say and not only you're talking about india there are cities all around the globe that have paid the cost china has been paying it ever since a long time earlier we used to use uh, read in our books that there's something called smog but we never experienced it but in the present scenarios we are experiencing it and we find that it's really bad fog is good smog is not right so that's a harsh reality okay so industries if we talk about are responsible for air water land and noise pollution the different kinds of pollution the very similar categories that we have already been learning us since a long time now very simple when you talk about air pollution how is air pollution caused a great amount of undesirable substances or undesirable toxic gases and substances are present in the air that pollute the air that make it very harmful for the people to breathe right so that can be sulfur dioxide carbon monoxide or a huge bunch of some other particulate matter like pm 2.5 pm 10 or some other harmful gases that all over pollutes the air right now what if i what as what are, what are the major things that are responsible for this smoke emitted by chemical and paper factories that's a toxic smoke toxic fumes isn't it that have good amount of greenhouse gases in them good amount of undesirable particles in them that ultimately pollute the atmosphere around or you can talk about the smoke coming out from the brick kilns where the bricks are made refineries or the smelting plants and when we burn the fossil fuels like coal petroleum right the kind of vehicles that we already you know ply on the roads on a daily basis so that also contributed to the much uh, serious problems of pollution all around now this 
affects not only the human health but also the plants the buildings the animals every now day if you see uh, like morning whenever i like uh, start from my place for my office or for like uh, any kind of work or any kind of recordings you know for videos for you so when i start uh, coming out from my place when i start from my office basically i come across uh, the local municipalities spraying water on the plants because and they do it on a daily basis despite them doing it on a daily basis there is a thick coat of dust on the plants itself now plants are getting choked can you imagine that when the lungs of the city will be choked how can you imagine people to breathe some really fresh air so that's the kind of price people are paying for the ultra modernization or urbanization we can say now when you talk about water pollution it is caused by organic and inorganic industrial waste what happens there are systems there are treatment plants there are guidelines for the industries to treat their effluents industrial effluents and waste water before releasing them into the water bodies but the point is who cares and who cares is just because the labor attitude of the respective authorities who are least bothered in actually checking out the real problem there are conventions all around the globe people just go there sign the different declarations have a good hearty meal and then come back or maybe address some kind of press conferences but what about the concrete steps what about the ground level steps they have never been made government will definitely release a guideline but what about the people responsible for definitely impactfully implementing those guidelines they are least bothered they go to the so called factories enjoy some healthy snacks out there some good snacks out there take some snacks with them and then come back and again that again that sewage Uh, effluents are being dumped into the water bodies without even being treated but who is paying the cost the cost is being paid by the poor aquatic animals the cost is being by, paid by the local residents of that place who are not getting the pure and uh, safe drinking water so nobody is bothered isn't it so water pollution that's again a, a great amount of damage that is doing to the aquatic wildlife in fact if i talk about fly ash phosphor gypsum iron and steel slags all the impurities all the waste materials are directly dumped as solid waste into the water bodies and that is somewhere or the other decreasing the amount of oxygen levels available you would be very much you know amazed to know that gangetic dolphin used to exist in good numbers at one point of time now because of the deteriorating quality of the river water they have started to become extinct almost now we are just losing our diversity we are losing our flora and fauna at the cost of development isn't it when you talk about the thermal pollution the thermal power plants it occurs when hot water from the factories is uh, directly you know introduced into the nearby streams or rivers so hot water will definitely all of a sudden increase the water surface temperature and that is not at all very good for the aquatic life forms down there so this again adds to a great amount of pollution industrial construction activities machinery factory equipments generators all these kinds of things they produce a huge amount of noise adding to the noise pollutions isn't it now this can cause permanent hearing impairments increase heart rate blood pressure among the people with certain kind of psychological effects certain kinds of problems and even in normal and healthy people so we see that the huge amount we are paying for our kind of activities it's not that the development is bad it's not it's not that factories are bad it's only that we are not following the proper norms it's only that we are not following the regulations which is making it worse we are not talking about sustainability of the development here right some suggestions that we can talk about how can we mitigate this that is we can reduce we can minimize the use the water for processing by reusing and recycling it instead of dumping that waste water better it's recycle that same water reuse that water successive times multiple times and then finally when you feel that that water is of no good use then you can treat it and then release into the nearby water bodies so that way we can help a lot harvesting of the rain water is very important again rain water harvesting is of great importance we are wasting a lot amount of rain water treating the hot water and the chemicals the industrial effluents before we dump it into the rivers and ponds that's again a very important one we can control the air pollution particulate matter here stands for pm in the air can be reduced by fitting smoke stacks to factories with electrostatic precipitators that can basically burn up the impurities before the smoke gets released in the before the smoke gets released in the atmosphere right or they can absorb the impurities so they can be fitted with scrubbers and fabric filters smoke can be reduced by using oil or gas instead of coal in factories because coal on burning produces huge huge amount of stroke isn't it we can reduce that by using some alternative kind of oil or gas we can also use some alternative kinds of energy resources in place of the traditional ones that can help us to reduce pollution right now from noise pollution the machinery and equipment can be used 
generators can be fitted with silencers so we see that generators have silencers that comparatively reduces the noise pollution noise absorbing materials can be used right so wherever we are working or constructing or doing any kind of work there we can use noise absorbers or some, we can use a kind of materials that has a good uh, you can say capacity to absorb the overall sound around the area so such kind of measures can always be taken to mitigate the pollution problems now we see a very good example in the form of ntpc that's national thermal power corporation of india so that is set an example of sustainable development let's try to get into it it's a major power uh, providing corporation in india it has a iso certification of environment management system can you imagine 14001 so the corporation has a very good approach with respect to preserving the natural environment and the natural resources the common ones water oil gas everything okay so how this has been possible how this has been possible number one proper utilization of equipment adopting the latest techniques that can minimize the harmful hazards of these equipments okay so they have upgraded their equipment to the next possible the best possible level so that they can minimize okay they can minimize the pollution uh, that will be created out of them minimizing the waste generation by maximizing ash utilization so basically it produces thermal energy thermal power so what they do is whatever ash is produced do you try to utilize that ash in the most constructible manner uh, instead of just you know dumping it outside somewhere so providing green belts for nurturing ecological balance and addressing the question of vehicles now what they have done is they have planted several green belts now these green belts are like it can be a stretch of vegetation all around so that will help to keep the ecological balance maintained at the same point of time apart from that if we see reducing environmental pollution through ash pond management ash water recycling liquid waste management so whatever the liquid water whatever the waste water is produced they have tried to minimize the use of it they have tried to you know recycle it reuse it so that that is not actually directly dumped into the nearby water bodies and ecological monitoring monitoring reviews okay database management of all the power stations are the policies being followed very strictly or not so these are the different kinds of measures they have put in to mitigate the different kinds of pollution menaces right now so with this <laughs> we come to the end of our story our discussion for the day i know it has been a long one but still this one shot discussion will help you a lot just before you are preparing for the exams in fact and remember whenever you want to start always try to start a little early so that will help you that will help to provide the last moment hassle and at time what happens people they stock up the material and they keep it for the last moment and the last moment becomes very difficult for them isn't it so avoid such kind of you know hassles and bustles and try to plan things in little bit in prior so that you get the maximum out of it okay so i'm going to meet you in the very next discussion of ours and till then i just want you to be happy healthy smiling always and the questions that i have asked i expect your answers in the comment section so let's meet in the next discussion so till then stay happy stay smiling and stay tuned with pw bye bye